Hello, I'm Tom, this is Forge Docs, and I'm joined here with Paul Blumfield. Hello, you're the uh, MP for Sheffield Central. Um, I am indeed, yes. So, um, glad you, to be here. You've joined us today. Um, I think, first of all, um, you know, I'm going to address the elephant in the room. This was intended to be a, a talk with lots of students, and unfortunately there hasn't been enough tickets sold. Do you think that students are now feeling disenchanted with politics and not wanting to engage as much as maybe they did in the past? Um, well, also I understand the uh, links book, the tickets wasn't working at key stages. That is also so another problem, <laughs> yes. Um, so um, I hope that uh, it's a technology blip rather than a yes. anti-politics uh, phenomenon. Yeah, because you know, we, we've done talks in the past when the link has worked and there's been um, plenty of students involved uh, you know, who've bought tickets. But it, having said that, do you still think there is a difference with students engaging in politics nowadays or do you think that it's still as many as it always has been? Um, I, I think there is a dangerous mood of uh, anti-politics and uh, students are usually at the cutting edge of trends mm. and there's a trend of uh, scepticism bordering onto cynicism which I stood for election in 2010 to try to counter because you start by being sceptical, you move into cynicism and you end up with Donald Trump mm. and so I think it's really important that we do find ways of engaging and recognising that we have to nurture and uh, nourish yeah. democratic uh, do politics. You, do you think with the, the rise of Trump and you know, these sort of populist um, leaders, so to speak, um, do you think that has had a big impact on politics on, as, the whole, as a whole? I think it has the potential to have a much more devastating impact on politics. I think we're at a bit of a tipping point if you look at some of the elections that are coming up across the rest of Europe. Mm. Um, if you look at the Brexit vote, arguably, last year, um, the divisiveness, the binary nature, the wishing politics to be much more uh, designed to suit everybody's individual preferences at any one time, rather than recognising the complexity, the nuance, and the difficulty of trying to reach complex uh, solutions. Um, and you know, back to Trump, do you think the kind of things that Trump has been, you know, his policies that he's been creating, how much of an impact is that going to have, not just on um, Britain, but maybe even at Sheffield, you know, locally? Will, will that have an impact, do you think? We can't disentangle the interests of Sheffield uh, from the interests of our country and, and Europe. I mean, Trump is deeply offensive, a racist, a sexist. He's even more dangerous than that because if you look at um, his major reversal of US foreign policy, so he's trying to undermine the United Nations, he is talking about NATO as obsolete, and he has, as a foreign policy objective, the destruction of the European Union. Now this goes against seven decades of American foreign policy. It is hugely destabilizing. And it will only be welcomed by Vladimir Putin. This is a dangerous moment for the West. And are you personally worried about you know, his close links to Russia and Vladimir Putin? I'm worried that he is operating as a completely different sort of politician out of the Vladimir Putin playbook. So if you look at his inaugural speech, for example, that's a moment when presidents try to pull the country together after an election where there are inevitably divisions. Um, they tried to give the country hope. He talked about a country of carnage. He railed against um, Washington, against politicians, against the judiciary, against the media. This is the Vladimir Putin playbook of demagoguery. It's, it's very dangerous. Um, and We've also seen Brexit, of course, um, which you mentioned a little bit, um, and this idea of hope, um, and you know, after a, a, a vote, which obviously, whichever way the vote would have gone, there is going to be a, a divide in the country. But we, we haven't really seen enough of a force to bring everyone together. I mean, Theresa May's tried, but I don't think she's done a good enough job. What do you think the solution would have been? Um, and to be honest, we've not really seen Corbyn do it either. Um, and the Labour Party is in a little bit of a mess. Um, would, would, would you agree that it's in a, you know, politically it's a time of turmoil, so to speak? Well, 
Let me start with your, uh, your first point. You say Theresa May has tried to bring the country together after Brexit. I don't think she has. I mean, that referendum was one of the most unpleasant campaigns that I've ever been involved in. And I've been involved in lots of elections and lots of political campaigns. But it was so divisive, it sought to build a proposition to leave the European Union on hatred and fear. Uh, and it left a legacy of, uh, of deep discomfort among many sections of, uh, of, of our community. And uh, I mean, I've experienced that since with people writing to me. We've had, seen a huge rise in hate crime um, and, a, and, and a round of intolerance. And what uh, Theresa May should have done was to say, look, this was a very close vote. 52%, 48%. We've got to try to govern for the 100%. And we ought to be sitting down maturely with our European partners and saying, what sort of new relationship can we have? Because we want to continue to be close to the European Union, and 48% of our countries wants to still be in the European Union. Instead, she has allowed the Brexiteers, the John Redwoods, the Ian Duncan Smiths, uh, and those on the hard right of her party, to dictate the terms. And so instead of trying to build bridges with the European Union, she's issued threats. And she sent Boris Johnson around the globe to issue insults. It's no way to deal with it. Um, and so moving on to um, within the Labour Party, um, and you know, after Brexit, we saw, you know, the, the couple of days after Brexit, the, uh, the leadership race within the Conservative Party that should have really been a time that the Labour Party came together and you know started campaigning as a unit but that didn't happen why do you think that didn't happen well probably like a lot of um, the body politic Labour was in shock at the at the outcome of the referendum um, it was one that was predictable but not predicted um, and obviously over the summer last summer Labour turned in on itself with a leadership campaign that I don't think we should have had um, and I think the majority of MPs didn't think we should have had but that was hugely distracting um, and uh, it, it set us back. Um, so what is your opinion with the, the leadership of the Labour Party? Do you think Corbyn is the right person for the job? Well I didn't campaign for Jeremy in either of the two elections uh, in the last one I was, uh, was working to see Owen Smith elected. Um, but you know, I think this is always the case within um, political parties. Every election you know, pits people against each other. Mm. Once the election's over, then you have to come together. And that's why I've accepted a job on Jeremy's front bench as a shadow Brexit minister. And I think it's terribly important that the, the party does come together, not kind of for us as politicians, that's the least uh, important part of it. But for the people that we represent, um, who are finding life tough at the moment, and who are being ridden over roughshod by a Tory government which isn't listening. Um, so I think it's a good time to you know, start to move away from Brexit and speak more about, um, as you said, the, the people who are having a tough time. Um, what do you think are the actual problems that people, particularly students, face within Sheffield? Well, students are only one part of the demographic. I mean, a lot of people are having tough times are having tough times because they have a lot of the difficulties that students don't face. You know, those who are much more dependent on the health service are looking at a, an NHS that's been broken by seven years of Tory rule. Um, there are those who have faced the bedroom tax, the additional charge for having an unoccupied room if you're in uh, social housing. Um, there are those who've seen their incomes diminish enormously um, at the same time that millionaires have been given tax breaks. So that growing inequality has affected people across the city. Um, students, and I'm proud to uh, represent far more students than any other member of parliament in the country. Uh, it often surprises people, but 36,000, around 30% of my constituents are students, and I'm always keen to uh, represent their interests. I set up an all-party parliamentary group to provide voice for students in Parliament, um, which is going really well and working with, uh, with NUS. I think students face uh, a lot of challenges. I mean, I um, oppose the trebling of tuition fees that we saw in the last 
Parliament, I tried to introduce an amendment to the Higher Education Bill to stop the government retrospectively changing the terms of loans, which is outrageous, mm. and, um, which has, uh, has been done to make students bear even more of the burden of the cost of their, uh, of their higher education. Our university is going to face huge challenges as a result of Brexit, losing research income and the potential threat to the dynamism of our campuses by losing significant numbers of international students. So there are a lot of issues facing, uh, facing and, students. Um, and while we mentioned about the, you know, the frameworks that have been put in place with tuition fees, there's the uh, Teach Excellence framework. Um, I'd just like to hear what are your thoughts on that framework? Well, I've been uh, deeply involved in it because um, as well as being the chair of the All-Party Student Group, I'm secretary of the All-Party University Group and um, I was on the, on the bill committee which considered the higher education bill line by line and that's the bill which is introducing the teaching excellence framework. I think that the government started off on the wrong foot by saying that our teaching was in many cases lamentable. I don't think that's true. I mean we have some of the best universities in the world I think the starting point should be celebrating succe that success, mm. saying, but how can we build on it? And in that context, having a way of measuring teaching quality to complement the way that we measure research quality probably isn't a bad thing. But if you're going to do it, and if you're going to award universities gold, silver, bronze medals on the basis of that framework, you've got to get it right and the government have got it wrong. They got it wrong because the three key metrics are the National Student Survey, which is a measure of satisfaction, not of teaching quality. Mm -hmm. the, their second measure is retention, the success that universities have in keeping people from entering to completing their course, which will encourage gaming because it will, if you want to be successful in the league table, mm. then just don't take in numbers of students that need extra support to succeed yeah. and that goes against the government's objectives on widening participation mm. and most crucially their measure is about um, employment um, outcomes. As I told Joe Johnson who comes from a pretty privileged family and is obviously the, mm. the uh, university's minister, you can, if you come from the right family, go to Eton as Joe did, mm. go on to Oxford and be uh, immediately uh, put into a, uh, a very successful career mm. it doesn't matter how good or how bad your teaching was at Oxford yeah on the other hand you can go to a university which provides really excellent teaching but if you're from the wrong background didn't go to the right school if you're a BME student you won't have the same uh, employment outcome mm. so if we're going to measure teaching quality we've got to be clear that the metrics that we're using really do that and these ones are flawed yeah I think I agree that um, teaching needs to be celebrated because I think a lot of effort particularly with the Russell group it's put onto the research but I think sometimes the actual teaching is neglected um, how do you think would be the best way of celebrating the teaching within universities well I mean a lot um, I mean obviously I used to uh, work here at the university mm. uh, and, um, and in the student union um, and I think a lot has changed over the years. The introduce, introduction of the National Student Survey, although um, it's not perfect, actually did force universities to focus on areas where they weren't doing as well. Assessment and feedback, for example. Still haven't got it right, or haven't got it perfect, but there's been significant improvement. Um, so embedding student feedback to force change, I think, is, uh, is really important. But giving people giving institutions across the board gold, silver, bronze ratings uh, on the basis of the jobs that their graduates go into is no measure of teaching quality mm. and doesn't provide the sort of uh, driver for improving teaching. Yeah, I think I agree there. Um, and so you, you touched on the, the NSS, um, the, the student survey. Um, there's currently a campaign to boycott the NSS um, that's happening here at Sheffield and across the country. I think there's 24 universities. Um, do you think that's a good idea that, you know, as a stand against the, uh, the, the TEF, the Teach Excellence Framework? Well, I think that 
students and student unions have got to make their own decisions about the best way of um, fighting it. And it's a difficult, um, it's a difficult balance because uh, the NSS is one of the few metrics that you can, as a student body, impact on mm. um, by by not participating in it. Um, but at the same time, in the past, it has been a driver for improving teaching quality. So I think you know each individual student union is going to kind of weigh that up and decide what the best way forward is. Um, but the the real pressure ought to be to put on put on the government to get the whole quality framework right and crucially not link it to fee increases. Mm. Um, so I'm trying to think of a way to word this. Um, there's a lot of things that happen in government that affect students, like the, the TEF. Um, what do you think is the best way for students to engage with the politics um, and you know, get involved in what's happening in Westminster? Well, I mean, I think it's really important that students do. Um, participating in elections is a starting point. Mm. But do uh, you think there is some sort of platform that exists, or should there be a platform that exists for students to get involved? And maybe even, you know, um, 16, and uh, you know, l lowering the, the age to vote, do you think that would be, you know, would that be a stepping stone to take? Yeah, I think it would. I mean, I've campaigned for votes for 16, 17 year olds for a long time. Um, <laughs> Labour fought the last election on a pledge to do that. Mm. We, uh, if we've been voted into power. I think it makes all the difference, because if you look at the last parliament, um, older people who both have the vote and use it in significant numbers uh, were the attention of a lot of policy. You know, they were protected, triple lock on pensions, all of the other issues, and I'm not necessarily arguing against that. But whilst there were those protections for older people, young people were screwed over. Tuition fees trebled, the education maintenance allowance for those staying on at schools and colleges left, continual youth unemployment not dealt with. So politicians listen to those who kind of shape their, uh, sh shape the outcome of elections. Mm. And the fact that young people tend not to vote even where they have it is a crucial issue. So for example, if at the last election young people had voted in the same proportion as over 65s, we wouldn't have a Conservative government, mm. we wouldn't have had a referendum, we wouldn't be leaving the European Union. Mm. So, I know it's a very difficult question, you've probably asked yourself this, but why aren't students voting? I think there is, as we said earlier, there is a scepticism about politics. Um, there is a, uh, and that's kind of developed beyond that into a cynicism a sense that, and I hear it when I, you know, I spend a lot of time knocking on doors in the constituency and talking to uh, students among others, um, a sense that voting doesn't make a difference, um, things will happen to me, nev whoever gets elected. Well, the last couple of years have demonstrated that's absolutely not true. Mm. You know, if, the, uh, if the Conservatives hadn't got an overall majority in the last parliament, we wouldn't be exiting the European Union. And if uh, people have voted in larger numbers, that would have been, you know, that we, we could have achieved that. So I understand the scepticism about politics, but people have got to recognize that it's not perfect. And most organizations created by people aren't perfect. But to have a system where we can elect people in order to shape outcomes and shape policies is something that is worth a little bit of time investing in. Mm. Um, so what are you doing personally locally in Sheffield to you know, try and get more students? Because you've got 36,000 students in your constituency. What are, your, you, what are you doing to engage with those people? Well, I mean, I've, uh, just this afternoon I've been talking to a conference of course reps um, at Hallam University. Uh, I'm talking to you now. Yeah. I meet regularly uh, with the student union um, leadership in both uh, universities. Mm. I try very hard to um, organise events um, which, uh, uh, which students can come along to. Uh, I, m once a month I send out a newsletter which lots of students have signed up for, telling them what I'm doing in Parliament and giving them the chance to sound off to me about things they think, that they think I should be doing. 
Um, and basically just trying to reach out. Um, and uh, I hope our conversation tonight will help. Mm. Uh, and, and what other steps are you planning on taking to maybe increase the engagement overall, you know, not just with students, within the whole of Sheffield? What, what are your goals to try and get more people involved? Um, well, one of, the, one of the things I launched um, about five years ago, shortly after I was elected in 2010 uh, for the first time, um, was uh, an annual community consultation. So in the recess period in uh, September, over three weeks, uh, last year I organised about 50 different community events. More than a thousand people came along. A further thousand filled in surveys saying, these are my priorities, what can you take up? What, what can you do for me? And I systematically go through all of the issues that are raised and see what's the best way of progressing that in Parliament. So, for example, I mean, I, um, in the last Parliament, I got the rules around payday lenders changed. Um, you know, the quick quids, wongas mm. of this world. Um, because people were saying to me in the meetings that I had with them that they were getting screwed over by oppressive interest rates mm. um, and a whole bunch of other conditions. Uh, and so I asked myself the question, well, what can I do as a politician to change that? And we, I built a coalition across parties um, to force change through the rules applied by the Financial Conduct Authority, which we did. The following year, Citizens Advice reported that they'd had half the number of complaints from people affected by abusive payday lending conditions. So what I've been trying to do consistently is kind of listen to people about what their problems are and work out how I can translate that into concrete action which will change lives. It's harder when you're in opposition, mm. but I'm doing my best. Um, and I think we'll, we'll wrap up with one final thing about, you know, as you said, about being in the opposition. What do you think Labour need to do to challenge the Conservatives? We need to develop a more effective uh, narrative in terms of what's going wrong in people's lives and how can we change it. Um, we clearly uh, suffered after a period of extraordinary success from the 97 government right through to the point at which the bankers crashed the economy um, in 2008. Um, we suffered since 2008 for being the people whose hands were on the steering wheel at the point that the um, bankers crashed the economy. But that wasn't a UK phenomenon, clearly it was an international phenomenon. Yeah. And I think that we've got some way to go to rebuild confidence in handling the economy and also making sure that we have a clear set of policies for the issues that affect people in their daily lives. Housing, jobs that are well paid and secure, um, and services that people want. Now, you know, the, NH the crisis in the NHS um, is something that's an illustration as well of the difference that politics makes. The sort of things we've seen over the last week on the BBC of patients stacked up in beds, in mm. corridors, not getting treatment, is exactly what I remember from 1997 mm. when Labour was elected to power because we inherited a broken NHS, mm. we had clear policies, we trebled the expenditure on it, more doctors, more nurses, more hospitals, more medical centres, restoring spending to the European average and at the point we left power the level of public satisfaction in the NHS had never been higher. It took the Tories 18 years to wreck the NHS last time, yeah. this time they've done it in seven. Yeah. So we need policies on all of those issues which can show how politics can change people's lives. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, that's, we've, we've gone on for quite a while there. So uh, Paul Blomfield, thank you very much for joining me. Good to talk to you.